on a rocky beach in South Wales, where the waves lap the shores and the seagulls cry, children can be heard playing, singing and laughing merrily. This is T. Havan, a place where the families of children expected to die young learn to live life to the full. Butterflies are seen everywhere in T. Havan Children's Hospice, a metaphor for the short yet beautiful lives that the charity helped to create for the children. When a child is so unwell that they're not expected to live into adulthood, they turn to T. Havan. Referred in a time of need, they're in search of care and support. The hospice helps often over many years to fulfill every potential, and at the end of their lives, they are there to provide support, care, and love. The philosophical wisdom of an inspirational teenager and the love of a parent protecting a child fighting cruel fate. These are the stories of humanity shining through in a time of adversity. <laughs> so the funny stands you, Ma. <laughs> like laughing. Jack Thomas's ambition is to get arrested. I'm always laughing. A children's hospice is not just a place where young people go to die. T Haven is more than a building. The charity also works with families in their homes, and today they have arranged for Bryce, a graffiti artist, to paint a wall in Jack's bedroom. Typical teenager, cannabis leaf and guns, and his name. His mum Joe has learned over the years that with Jack, you just go with the flow. You want like a proper boys' room, don't you? Yeah, like a boys' room. I just feel that he's 16. If he can have it now, when can he have it? Just try and cram in as much as we can. You know, while he's here and he has what he wants, basically. I like my mate going around to play games and watch movies and stuff. Yeah. With the mural in full flow, Bryce needs help with getting the gun right. Luckily, Chloe, Jack's sister, is on hand to model one of Jack's toy guns. All right, cool. Let's give that a go. Ah! Well, he's one of the funniest kids I've ever met. Uh, he's so dry. he got a fantastic sense of humour. Do you want, like, a Russian-manufactured gun or a... Welsh manufactured, and then the Welsh people make guns. Yeah. He never moans, never moans. He could be in agony, and he don't moan. He just he gets on with it. Um, he's just brilliant, really. We're so lucky that he's got such a good outlook on life. You know, it's to live. You know, and he lives it every day to the best of his ability. You know, like in James Bond. Yeah. You know, you... Shirley Valentino yeah, of T. Havan has a strong relationship with Jack and his family, built over a decade. You kind of have to identify with, you know, with, with Jack, in a sense, that he wants all the things that my son wants um, at this age, you know. Um, and about, yet yeah, you have to understand that, unlike my son, he's also dealing with the other side. He's also dealing with the condition. And he knows you know, the end result of his condition is death. And that, I guess, is, you, you, you're working on a knife edge all the time. Jack suffers from Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a particularly cruel, incurable genetic condition that progressively destroys the muscles in the bodies of boys. Difficulty walking at around three is the first sign, by the age of 10, they go off their feet and start using a wheelchair. Jack is now 15, but he's not expected to live beyond his early 20s. We don't really talk about um, the obvious. Um, when Jack's ready to talk to me about it, obviously I'll answer his questions and things. Um, he, he, know, he knows, and I know that he, he knows that... Um, he's going to have a short life. But we just, we try not to think about that. We just, 
we just basically live for today. And I think if he if he got a look at life, if he looks at life like that, then we've sort of we've got to, you know, we got to be strong because he's such a strong character. So, um, so yeah, we just just treasure him while we got him. What do you think? It's awesome. Ah, cool. Got your canvas leaf in. Managed to squeeze the gun in a little yeah. bit. It's nice. Bones! <laughs> nice and mate. Bang. Yeah, no worries. So I have pain all of the time. I find the idea of not having pain really weird. I have to write down my pain scores every day and my average pain score is between a 5 and a 7. A lot of people don't believe you can have that much pain and talk as much as I do, I think. Amy Claire Davis is in Tea Haven for the weekend. It's the first time in four years the teenager spent a few days away from her parents, who care for her around the clock. Oh, we're going for the just got out of bed look, are we? She suffers from a mysterious, agonising condition in which her body's major functions have failed. Yeah. To give her any standard of living, she goes to hospital for intense treatment every month. She relies on a complex medical regime that involves taking some of the strongest pain relief drugs available. I could live to be 18, but I could live to be 62 because we don't know how it works. So I think I have a lot of hope anyway. I mean, I'm not going down without a bit of a fight. <laughs> T. Havan have invited local well-wishers to bring in their flash cars to let the children and their families have a close look. I really like the cars because they're fast. <laughs> Amy's stay is only possible because the staff have the specialist skills needed to take on the care role that her parents normally perform. Thank you so much for my present. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Kelly Ursel is usually her carer when she comes to stay at Tea Haven, and they're as thick as thieves. Amy's put together the things to do before I kick the bucket list, and number 53 on that list is a ride in a Lamborghini. It's nice, isn't it? I'll have that on my Christmas list. Yeah, I, I was going to say. 18th birthday? <laughs> oh, yeah. 17th birthday, even? <laughs> she had a difficult night last night. And she can tend to be a bit tired the day after then as well. But, um, yeah, she has been looking forward to it. And I think she wants to... Uh, she told me she wants to go in when... I'm not so sure where she should, but I'm sure she will. She's not scared of anything, Amy. Come on, then, Come on and jump in. I don't know, I'm going to get back out of her mind. We'll figure that out when the time comes. Oh, it's amazing, mind. <laughs> Despite the urge to wrap her up in cotton wool, Kelly knows that for Amy to quench her thirst for life, she must be allowed to taste independence like any other girl her age. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> well done, eh? Oh, it's stunning. First time in a Lamborghini? First time. First time. Oh, yeah. It's stunning. I'm looking at my watch, <laughs> thinking, Dion, just bring it back in one piece. Um, on, I think the thing is with Amy, and this is truthfully now she um with her condition she's so unpredictable and now she can be and within five minutes she can go from being amy claire you've seen getting in the lamborghini to amy claire being really quite poorly and very distressed and upset so to just have her out of your sight for five minutes and to know you're not there and in that five minutes that could happen is a little bit leaves you on tender hooks a little bit i don't know how mum and dad do it all the time Amazing, but your stomach was like, you left your stomach behind 
some other time, but it was really good. And I'm just going to have to turn my tap off. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right in the middle of the conversation. I was getting a bit, more than a bit anxious, I think, waiting for it. We got a bit lost going down one of the roads. Oh, my dinner started coming back up and everything, <laughs> thinking, where is she? I went running down there. <laughs> but you enjoyed it, so it was worth it, wasn't it? Good, good. <laughs> Tired now, though, are you? I can see, yeah. Uh, go inside for a bit of a chill. Yeah. The Tea Haven staff deal with dozens of cases at any one time. But today, Shirley's had to drop everything as a crisis has occurred. I got a phone call um, from Jack's mum, Jo, just to say that they were in the hospital and that he'd been admitted and she was waiting for the results of his test and the result was that he has cancer. Jack had not been feeling well for a few days. His parents thought it might be an infection, which isn't uncommon for a boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. However, it turned out to be much more serious. Doctors found a tumour which turned out to be testicular cancer. Joe has asked Shirley to be by his side. They're dealing with a life and death situation. They're... Jack's going in for an operation, um, but it's high risk. Not because of the cancer because, because of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and the diabetes have an added complication to the operation. As a parent, I can't imagine what that must be like to n have the knowledge that your, your child needs a, um, an operation, but there's going to be a risk that he might not recover. Hello. On the ward, Jack's dealing with the news in his own inimitable fashion. Yeah, oh, same face, look. Smile, Jack. <laughs> for Mum Jo, who expected to have him with her for years yet, the news has come as a terrible blow. It just don't seem fair that he's got to go through any more than what he already has gone through. It, you know, his whole life has been a battle. And he's coped very well with all of that. But now, you know, this is, this is something more worrying than, than anything else he's had to cope with. The family have got used to living with Duchenne, but it hasn't prepared them for the thought of losing Jack at only 15. Shirley's dealt with life and death situations on many occasions during her time at the hospice. Her experience, advice and emotional support will be an invaluable help to Joe during this difficult time. I've never really wanted to talk about end of life with Shirley um, because Jack has always been so well and we just, we don't like to think about that. But now this has happened, you know, it's, it's sort of made us, we need to talk about things like that and, you know, what we need to do and what we need to put in place and, and things. You know, just in case things were to go wrong. You looking forward to putting the cap and gown on? What? <laughs> what? You design the cap. Uh, the, the gown. You design a gown. Oh, I don't mind. You don't mind that. What bit about bit breezy. It's important to me to pass the exams because everybody does it. One. and also because I do want to get a job in the future and I want to have a good job and a job that I enjoy doing. I don't just want to work in a supermarket checkout. Amy Clare is usually too ill to attend school, so she has a few hours of home tuition every day. This month, she's going to have to sit her GCSE exams from her bedroom. She's expected to get A stars. Even though I might not have a future, I plan like I do. And even though I don't set like ridiculous long-term goals, like I tend to set sort of one-year, two-year goals. So a couple of years ago it was, right, get GCSEs, sit my exams and go to prom. So now I'm 
sort of nearing that. I'm sort of sitting here thinking, right, I want to be 17. Which even though it's a bit of a random age, to be honest, I didn't want to be 16, I'm not that bothered about 18, but I really want to be 17. And I do plan about moving out and having my own flat and doing a job that I really enjoy. And I think about things, I do want to get married and have a baby and I want to go to my friends' weddings and I want to do things like that, things that everyone else does. And I think even though I'm less likely to have that future, I probably plan more than my other friends would just because I've had to think in more detail what would I really like to do. Parents Steve and Caroline have been told on many occasions not to expect Amy to live beyond her childhood. But she keeps on defying the odds. Do we dare to hope for a future? Yeah. There are lots and lots of moments in lots and lots of days that we do. We were talking about Amy's future last night on the set because obviously we got GCSEs and things. Stephen hates talking about it at all because it's like the acknowledgement that at some point something is going to go belly up potentially. I don't, I don't feel like that anymore. I think it took us a long, long time to come to the realisation that quality is far better than quantity. So for us, I want her to plan and talk about the future and have ambition because it improves her quality of life now. It's, it's about what does she want to be, what does she want to do, and without any of that, you can't, you can't live a quality life, you can't be a real person if you've got no ambition, if you've got no interest, if you've got no focus. Today's the 11th of March, the day Jack has his operation. I'm being called one ball. How do you feel, Jack? I don't know. Are you nervous? A little bit. A little bit nervous? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Jack's Duchenne and diabetes mean that any general anaesthetic could cause fatal complications. Only a few months ago, one of Jack's friends with the same condition died whilst in theatre. He just takes everything, you know, in his stride, everything goes above him, but this has knocked him sideways. Um, and he's angry, he feels, you know, why, why him? Jack just before he's going down to theatre. You know, he, he got a lot to put up with and now, You've just been hit with the, the worst news you could ever be given. It's just been a nightmare. It's been the worst week of our lives. This has been harder than when he was diagnosed as a baby. For now, Jack will be taken to theatre and it's time for the family to say goodbye. I'm pulling my pants now. <laughs> I'm doing my second English GCSE exam today. Oh no. We literally have to do just the basics on a GCSE day. So we wake her two hours before her paper starts. She has a, a cup of tea and her breakfast, and then we do all her meds. And then she goes and does her bowel washout, which is her essential. And then we go clean pyjamas on, back into bed, then ready for the paper to start. Brilliant. And, and so a well. larger print. A large print and, and yellow. It's quite stressful yellow doing an exam, but she's very, very aware now that bits, any kind of strong emotion, doesn't matter what it is, any like strong anxiety, they'll just make her spasms 120 times more likely to happen and 120 times worse than they are. You'll be absolutely fine, eh? You haven't missed a single bit of English work. Everything you've done, you've had an A or an A star for. How could you possibly not be fine? Because this is grammar. This isn't writing. Look, 
the time to worry is if you get unclassified more than once and English is your first language. Like you do. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really, really easy sometimes in our house because we're positive and particularly because the way Amy's attitude is towards her illness and perhaps our attitude, it's sometimes very, very easy to forget the moments that we've had where we've thought we're not going to bring her home from hospital this time. She's going to get worse and we're not going to have her for much longer. And sometimes when she's in one of her moments or her bits where... She's tootling along, I suppose, is the best description. It's incredibly easy to forget how poorly she is. And the only way I can describe it, you go along and you can be driving in the car and it cannot have crossed your mind all day. And then suddenly it crosses your mind and your stomach turns upside down and you feel sick. And you feel that horrible feeling because all we know is it's a cruel, horrible disease. But we don't know what it is. Other people might be hoping for a miracle cure We've gone past the point of the medical cure. It ain't here and it's not going to happen. And we've got no intention of wasting energy on a miracle cure. What we hope for is more good days than bad ones. I think it's gone OK. I know the second half has gone OK. I'm not just sure about the first part because I was a bit bored, to be honest. So I just got it finished as, po like, as quick as possible. We went to leave as assembly last week. And I remember, it's not that long ago, we thought we'd we never, ever see her leave school. Not ever. And we sat in Leaver's Assembly absolutely sobbing. Absolutely sobbing. Not because she's leaving school, but because it was a really, really, really amazing thing to achieve. It was really incredible. To watch someone to leave school, like her like a peers, really, when actually you spend a long time thinking she was never going to do it. But I think she does that to us a lot. <laughs> and that's what I mean about life. It would be a lot easier to say, oh, we're just not going to bother with school. Why, why are we bothering with school? She's got no future or whatever. She's got a future. She's got a huge future. It's just not the future that everybody else has. And it isn't the one that everybody wakes up in the morning and the general Joe Public perceives as a future. And I think Joe Public will find it very hard to understand that you can have such a lust and a passion for life when you've got all those things to face. But she does. Having said their last goodbyes, Jack's parents, Joe and Gary, have been suffering an agonising wait for over three hours. Shirley from T. Havan has not left their side. I've just spoken to the consultant and they need to test. He's doing really well. The tumour was contained, so they were able to remove it all. And he's breathing on his own. So fantastic, you. so <laughs> this is Jack now, just in recovery, feeling a bit sick, but he's doing so well. Having pulled through, only time will tell what scars the experience will leave on Jack and the family. When they were taking Jack down, I went down with him, um, and I wanted to go in with him until he went to sleep. Um, it was the most horrendous feeling in the world to think that I could have been saying goodbye to him for the last time. Um, when we first raised the thoughts of death, obviously it's really hard for the families. But the fact is that, those, that the parents are already upset, that they're already thinking all those thoughts. But how do you... How, in my experience, they've often said, how do we voice them? We have these thoughts in our heads, but how do we voice them? So for us, we're able to help them and give them space to voice those concerns. In the coming weeks and months, Shirley from T. Havan will work closely with the family to help them come to terms with their feelings regarding death. They've always known that Jack may only live a short life, 
But the recent events have been a cruel reminder of the emotions they'll have to face when the time comes. I am scared about dying, but it's not so much about the dying part. It's more about what I leave behind. It's the people and things that you leave behind. I bet I look really sick. Um, we can see everything. Oh no! My grandma says if you didn't laugh about it, you'd be crying. And I think that's the best way to be and make a joke about it. Amy, 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 Amy in the morning. It's Amy, Amy, Amy in the night. It's Amy, 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 Clara tea time. It's Amy, 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 yes, it's Amy, 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 yes, it's Amy, Amy, Amy all the time. It's Amy, 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 Amy all the time. It's a tragic irony that it's her cruel illness that's given Amy her unique perspective on life and death which has led to both her untamable lust for life and a mature philosophy that defies her young age. Though there may be no cure, for Amy, Steve and Caroline, laughter is the best medicine. I have one consultant, and when I was really ill about a year ago, before I started on my treatment, I was a lot, lot worse. And um, we went in and... I was talking about and I was saying, oh, yeah, well, now I've started having full body spasms and I get really bad back spasms most days and I have this most days and this happens and I get really bad pain and my patch has gone up. But we were just, like, cracking jokes as we were saying it all the way through. And normally, he's quite eccentric. He would be one of the doctors who would be laughing and cracking jokes as well. And he actually turned around and said... I know this is your way of coping by making it humorous, but actually, it's not that funny. What made you cry? I was saying about Johan. Yeah. And what did he say? He said, we trivialise it. But actually what's happening is a bit of a shit deal. And then he said, typical NHS, you can't find a tissue anyway when you want one, can you? No. Hmm? We had a loo roll. <laughs> a giant loo roll that was this big. And even he cried. He did cry. And I cried, and you cried. Because it is a shit deal. No. I'm really tired now. Are you tired? Mm. And it is a shit deal, I mean, but it's not a shit deal all the time, is it? I don't think it's a shit deal most of the time. No. What do you think it is then? I said I think I'm quite lucky. <laughs> Why? Because you got me. I know, Wayne. Because you're magic. <laughs> Why? Why do you think you're lucky? As I said, because I wouldn't have done all like those amazing things. Wouldn't. And I wouldn't, wouldn't have met all like the amazing I people. I wouldn't. Exactly, and I wouldn't know how You'd much. You'd be like my all the other sixteen-year-olds worrying about my mascara, which is lucky I don't wear on camera because I'd have it down here by now. Beautiful Lives returns at the same time next week here on BBC One Wales. If you've been affected by any of the issues in tonight's programme, details of organisations offering information